commend it to the book to you if you have not read it yet for the summer reading list. Uh, if you're ever going through a rough patch, uh, whether it's a, a job search, a failure, like Mike Ryan alluded to, how to best profit from it. Uh, we'd like to present Mr. Zamperini uh, the Simon School uh, Commendation Award that recognizes a leader who throughout his or her life has demonstrated integrity, determination, resilience, and philanthropy, qualities that our school strives to impart to each of its students. This year, we recognize Louis Zamperini, an All-American runner, a two-time NCAA champion, the first American 5,000-meter finisher at the 1936 Berlin Games, and a war hero. Louis is also a humanitarian who travels the world counseling war veterans and young people about forgiveness and the important role it can play in their lives. Louis led a life of strength, determination, philanthropy, and integrity. As a son of poor immigrants, he was born in nearby Olean here. He used his athleticism to go on to college and the Olympics. Although he endured two years of torture at the hands of the Japanese in World War II, he has publicly forgiven his torturers. When the war ended, he returned to California, settled into life, married, raised two children, and sold war surplus to film studios. But he wanted to accomplish more. By chance, Louis attended an early Billy Graham revival and found religion. He founded the Outward Bound Style Victory Boys Camp, an organization that annually teaches thousands of high school dropouts outdoor skills, such as rappelling, skiing, water skills, and horsemanship. Today, Louis reaches an estimated 30,000 young people each year uh, with a message of positive attitude, resilience, and forgiveness. His life is a testament to the tenacity of the human spirit and the power of compassion. Uh, he quit uh, skateboarding when he was 81, uh, quit skiing when he was 90, uh, all of us should hope when we're 94, as he is today, to be a spry and have the mental acuity that he does. And one measure of his character, um, uh, his good friend John Neighbor, uh, who's a fellow Olympian, uh, John won four golds and one silver in swimming at the Montreal Olympics, first met Louis in 1983. But it wasn't until 1997 that he found out the rest of the story about Louis. Uh, before Louis was to carry the torch at Nagano, uh, past uh, the POW camp where he'd been interred. So please accept uh, our greatest honor and uh, our pleasure it is to have you here and to offer some remarks to our graduates to be. For the purpose of our understanding, how many out there prior to this morning had heard of the book Unbroken? <laughs> Unbroken is written by Laura Hillenbrand. She recently wrote the book Seabiscuit, and it was a very successful movie. And during her research on the horse, she kept running across the name Louis Zamperini. In fact, one newspaper reporter asked Louis's coach, is there somebody out there who can beat Louis Zamperini in the mile? And the coach said, if it is, it's probably Seabiscuit. And at that point, uh, Laura decided to write the book about Louis. And, and uh, just briefly, uh, after meeting Adolf Hitler and rooming with Jesse Owens at the Olympics, he uh, enlisted in the uh, U.S. Air Corps and was a bombardier in the South Pacific. And the plane on a reconnaissance run crashed, and Louis survived in a life raft for 47 days, drifting 2,000 miles before being captured by the Japanese, where, they, where at that point they decided to torture Louis because he was an Olympian. They wanted to convert him to propaganda purposes, and a particularly uh, uh, significant struggle for Louis's soul occurred, and uh, the name of the book is Unbroken. So I think you can tell the end of that story. Louis, you and I both knew William E. Simon as president of the U.S. Olympic Committee. What does this award today, the Simon School uh, Award, mean to you? Well, it, uh, actually, it's probably the climax of my life. I, I really appreciate it, and, and I'll take it with me the rest of my life. Well, that's very gracious of you. And, Louis, you're looking out at the student body. They're about to head into the real world. What tips might you have for them today? Well, as you leave here today, <laughs> your adventure really begins. And I, all I can say is when you go forth, go forth with the wisdom of Solomon. 
God bless you. Oh, that's nice. Uh, also, I should note that um, uh, Louis got a remarkable story to tell, which is being told in the book. Um, many people come to you and say, Louis, was living on a life raft for 47 days the worst thing that ever happened to you? Well, no, the, the worst thing that ever happened to me was when I was uh, picked up by the Japanese and put into a, a, a filthy little cell on the island of Kwajalein uh, for 43 days. And uh, Kwajalein was known in those days as Execution Island. And they had set uh, my day of execution. Uh, but the, the first thing I ran into on the island was a panel of uh, six Japanese officers, all dressed up in white uniforms. And they had a white tablecloth and uh, a lot of goodies and drinks. And uh, of course, we were vulnerable. And they knew it. And they teased us with the, uh, the food and the drinks, hoping we would answer their questions properly. Now, out of, out of one of those six uh, officers, uh, one of them uh, turned to me and said, Lieutenant Zapparini, when you were entering USC in 1936, I was graduating. Uh, and this guy was the most obnoxious of the six. I couldn't believe he was a Trojan. Uh, we believe in excellency in education, excellency in sports, excellency in morals, and this guy was the worst of the six. I finally had to come to the conclusion that he was a third year transfer from UCLA. <laughs> Louis, recently Tom Brokaw wrote a book and he called your generation the greatest generation, but you don't think that title is, is sufficient? No, I, uh, I did a pamphlet and a just with uh, the famous psychiatrist Dr. Matty and a, a Dr. Yule, another psychiatrist, called a Stress at the Naked Edge. And after about a year of study and putting this together, we finally came to the conclusion that we we're not the greatest generation, we were the hardy generation. And hardiness, you can explain, it's a question of overcoming. So when a problem approaches, instead of turning your back on the problem, you face it, commit yourself to it, and overcome it. And so every time you overcome uh, a problem, uh, you become more and more hardy. And I think the very first thing that prepared us for World War II was the fact that uh, and this is outlawed today. We were spanked with boards and belts, and uh, that toughened us up for uh, combat, and it, it made our uh, punishment in prison camp, the pain, more tolerable. Hmm. You are, or were, an Eagle Scout in high school, and you were one of the few soldiers in Hawaii to prepare themselves for the war by attending the survival classes and the other programs that were made available. What do you think is the value of education? Well, education, of course, is, no, should be number one in our life. You can't survive without education. Uh, when you hear people taking a hike in the local hills and they are missing, and uh, their relatives or friends always say, oh, don't worry, he or she is an experienced hiker. Well, experienced hiker means nothing. Have they, have they had survival training? And just a month ago, we lost a woman in L.A. on Mount Baldy. Oh, her family says, oh, she's an experienced hiker. Uh, if you're going to go hiking, an experienced hiker always has someone with them. And besides that, have you had survival training? Now, on Mount Hood every year, we lose two or three guys at 10,000 feet. I've climbed a 14,000-foot glacier in Wyoming in a blizzard, and we survived. Why? Because we had survival training. So education is extremely important, uh, not only for your future uh, to make a living, but if you're going to go into any kind of outdoor adventure, be prepared by taking survival courses before you leave. Mm -hmm. And our last little story, because you're so good at storytelling, two days after you met Adolf Hitler, because of your remarkable last lap in the 5,000 meters, you saw him again in a car drive up to the German chancellery what happened after that? Well, my buddy and I, we had a couple of German beers. <laughs> and, Anybody out here ever have any beers? I don't know. I, probably not. No, uh, then, then we saw this limousine pull up to this beautiful chancellery, groins and pillars. Uh, and, uh, and Hitler got out along with another general, I believe it was von Fritz, and uh, went inside. In the meantime, there were guards on the front walk. They would march from the corner to the center gate turn around and march back to the corner, so I timed them. 
And I figured I had plenty of time to get across the street, uh, tear this flag down, and get away with it. A, not, a Nazi flag on the wall of the chancellery. Yeah, and uh, well, anyway, so they started heading for the corner, and I quickly got across the street, had plenty of time to get the flag and get away. However, the flag was about a foot higher than I had anticipated, and I had to jump hard, and I jumped hard because I heard the guards screaming at me in German, and I clutched the flag in my fist, ripped it from the pole, and then I did what I do best. I started to run, and I heard a rifle shot in the air, and I heard the words, halt and see, halt and see. And so I stopped, best thing I ever did, and uh, they rushed up to me, and they spun me around rather rudely until they saw the Olympic circles on my jacket and the American flag. And then the one guard went inside the chancellery, and then he came out, and he mentioned Fritz, and I figured it was General von Fritz, who was later executed by Hitler for turning against his regime. And uh, so then he asked me very cautiously, but why did you stare down the swastika? And I said, I just wanted to take it home to America with me to always remind me of the wonderful time I had in your country. <laughs> he still has the flag.